Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the CEO of the Perth US Asia Center here at the University of Western Australia. And before we begin, uh, let me acknowledge that although we're meeting uh, virtually, our participants are in, in Delhi here in Perth and in, in Canberra, but the Perth US Asia Center is situated on the, uh, the traditional lands of the Noongar people, the, the Wajak people of the Noongar nation. And it is our tradition to acknowledge their uh, them as the traditional custodians of the land and to pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Having said that, uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to, to do a public launch of a report by one of our colleagues, Haley Channer, who is a senior policy fellow, uh, the first member of our Perth US Asia Center team formerly outside of, of, of Western Australia. Uh, Haley, I think many of you know, spent a number of years working for the Department of Defense, uh, previous to that working for the minister herself um, uh, as a, at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And so we feel very fortunate to have snatched her up uh, and quickly thrown her into the, the maelstrom that is our research team uh, with product coming out. Uh, in, in March of this year, uh, Haley authored a chapter in a book uh, which was called State of the United States. Uh, that looked at an emerging alliance agenda for Australia and the U.S. after the election of Joe Biden in the United States. Uh, and then she's taken a, a chapter that she wrote for that book and spun it into uh, a much more detailed and, and forward-looking part of our ongoing Indo-Pacific Insight series. Uh, and, and this particular report should have been shared with all of you who are with us here on the call today and more broadly with our community is on advancing the Australia-US-Japan infrastructure partnership through private sector engagement. Um, and at, at first glance, you know, infrastructure is one of those words that, that um, it, it goes through waves of being, being salient and sexy and, and, and other times when it just seems remarkably you know, foundational and in the weeds and it's not something you normally wanna talk about in roads and bridges. But when roads and bridges start falling down, uh, when you start talking about things in the United States like a a $2.3 trillion infrastructure package, uh, when you begin to realize that much of the contestation for our region is over investments in infrastructure, it gains incredible salience. And so we're really pleased with the research that Haley has done, particularly on the relationship between Australia and Japan and the United States. Um, but to have a, a fulsome discussion, our plan is to have Haley do a brief introduction to her report, some of the core findings, some of the core recommendations that come out of that, and then engage in, in a deeper conversation. We're very fortunate to have two other of our colleagues, and we call them both colleagues in this endeavor. Uh, we're happy to have Kyle Springer. Kyle Springer is also a policy fellow here in our Perth office. Uh, Kyle has been with us almost since the very inception of the Perth US Asia Center team, um, and, and uh, has written extensively himself on the topic. Uh, you may recall, I think it was just, maybe it's been two years ago, Kyle, I can't recall exactly. Kyle did a wonderful re report, a very interactive uh, map on Belt and Road Project and other infrastructure projects within Indonesia that has been ongoing using that. And then we're also joined from Delhi uh, by, by uh, Ritika Pasi, who is a visiting fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. I think all of you will know ORF as the host of, of the Ricina Dialogue kind of one of the go-to events around the globe, even in the midst of a pandemic. I was so impressed, Ratika, with how you and your team put that together, given everything else that was going on that time. And, and it just highlights the growing importance of India to all of us in that. But from our sakes today, we're especially happy that, that Ratika this year is one of our Indo-Pacific fellows. Uh, and we appreciate her research and writing her partnership with this endeavor. So we're looking forward to a very fulsome discussion. Uh, but to, to kick off that conversation, I'm gonna first turn to Haley. To, to, uh, to outline your report, again, conclusions and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gordon. And thanks very much to everyone for joining me. Um, I have been delighted to put this publication out. And if I was going to advertise it as if it was a movie, I would say it's got everything. It's got intrigue, it's got action, it's got drama. And the reason I say that is because infrastructure touches on so many different topics, right? It's got development aid, it's got government policy, you bring in economics when you bring in the private sector. But not only that, it's also got this bigger um, regional strategy story. And also in the way that you actually deliver the infrastructure, 
there's a real rules-based system and rules-based operation way that the infrastructure can be delivered. So this paper's got a bit of everything. And also because I'm originally from Queensland, the report has been written in a very clear, unambiguous way, easy to understand. So I really hope that everyone um, reads the full report um, as well as listens to this event. So where does this story begin about infrastructure? Well, the first thing to note is there's a huge need for infrastructure in our region. Um, and developing countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific um, lack basic infrastructure to help them stay connected, both physically and also electronically. So there's a need for better transport systems, a need for better communication systems. Um, many roads are low quality and dangerous for motorists and pedestrians. And there's also 400 million people in Asia who go without electricity every day. Uh, and even though we're spending $900 billion on infrastructure um, in the region every year, that is a far cry from the $1.7 trillion that the Asian Development Bank estimates that we're going to need annually up to 2030 to be able just to keep pace with growth. So this is really a story of um, people having a lower quality of life because they do not have critical infrastructure. And we really need to rectify this. So the next part of the story is um, back in 2013, China announced its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, now, basically, uh, this is a very large infrastructure investment. And I'm also going to um, just share some slides with you so that you can contextualize uh, what we're actually seeing with China's Belt and Road Initiative. So this slide is showing uh, a graphic here, which shows China's Belt and Road Initiative spanning all the way from Europe to Southeast Asia. But actually it goes further than that, it includes the Pacific. Um, as of January this year, China has signed cooperative agreements or pr undertaken projects in 171 countries and with international organizations. Um, however, China may be inflating its figures because China has been classifying any of its development aid um, to countries that have signed BRI MOUs, even if it's not infrastructure, as part of the BRI. Um, for example, China is building railways in Indonesia, railways, industrial zones and manufacturing plants in Thailand and commercial ports in Sri Lanka. However, some people have really criticized China's Belt and Road Initiative as having coercive elements. So for example, some railway projects in Malaysia have been canceled due to allegations of corruption. Railway projects in Thailand have faced continual delays because Thai authorities are worried about China's high interest rates and even the need for the scheme in the first place. So is there a great enough need to have to have these railway projects? And finally, um, a port in Sri Lanka is now owned by China for 99 years because, because Sri Lanka defaulted on its BRI loans. And also earlier this year, many people already know that the Australian government tore up a Victorian government's two Belt and Road Agreements. And I think that this shows that Australia sees China's major infrastructure initiative as far more than altruism, far more than just bricks and mortar. I think at the core, Australia sees China's Belt and Road um, as symbolic of a part of a larger Chinese strategy of influence and in fact to gain leverage over other countries. So I'm going to stop sharing for now and um, just basically say that um, putting to one side China's Belt and Road Initiative, there is so much need for infrastructure in our region that there's plenty of room for other players. So in steps Australia, the United States and Japan. So back in 2018, they announced their trilateral infrastructure partnership. Um, this partnership is being led by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade um, in the United States by the International Development Finance Corporation and in Japan by the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Now, the value proposition of the trilateral partnership is that it's going to deliver quality infrastructure to the region that upholds international best practice standards. Um, and the, the hook for countries is that there is uh, better quality, more transparency, debt sustainability and environmental and social safeguards. Once you have a higher quality asset, this is going to reduce the life cycle costs of the infrastructure over the long term, which means that it's going to give the developing country better returns. And also this emphasis on transparency and debt sustainability 
um, Australia, the US and Japan are seeking to reinforce the agency of developing countries and also strengthen liberal democratic processes. Finally, the trilateral partnership also emphasizes the need to leverage the private sector to deliver these projects. However, the Australia, US, Japan trilateral infrastructure project has been very slow to get off the ground since 2018. I'd love to be able to share a similar slide deck with you on the trilateral partnership, but there isn't much of a story to tell. The mm -hmm. first and only project of the partnership is a $20 million undersea fiber optic cable that will connect the Pacific Island country of Palau with Southeast Asia and then mainland USA. And this project doesn't include any private sector involvement. So there's a really long way before the trilateral partnership is going to be able to be seen as a credible alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So obviously uh, we see a lot of challenges that these three countries have faced in trying to do deliver infrastructure. Um, first of all, there's been the COVID pandemic, which is obviously um, really delayed everyone. Um, but there's also been a challenge in terms of getting the three governments to cooperate and decide on priorities for their infrastructure. So um, in Australia, DFAT is responsible for delivering the infrastructure, whereas in the United States and Japan, you have different agencies that um, are all tasked with doing this, this work. So it's not just the DFC in the United States and it's not just JBIC in Japan. And what you can see happening is sometimes um, agencies in all countries are you know, siloed in their operations and they don't always communicate with one another. So this has also led to challenges in working, not just between three different countries, but multiple different agencies. So even when you have three highly like-minded countries, uh, the picture is not always easy to communicate. Um, and if the private sector hasn't been convinced that there are commercial benefits to partnering with, uh, with us, there's a real problem here. So my research focused on how can we get the private sector on board and what's stopping them in the first place. So the last part of this story is, um, you know, what's stopping the private sector. And one of the things that I heard most of all is that um, companies really do overestimate the risk of starting projects in developing countries. And they also overestimate the benefits of uh, projects in developed countries. So there's this push pull factor happening. Um, there's often a lack of reliable data relating to circumstances in developing countries. There can be very large startup costs, um, which can be sunk assets if the project doesn't go ahead. And at the moment, there's no project pipeline that prioritizes commercial viability and return over the greatest development need. So you again see a lack of prioritizing private sector interests. So if you're a business looking to get into the infrastructure game in our region, there are a lot of roadblocks, blocks, especially if you don't have any existing contacts or experience working in infrastructure in our region. And what I wanted to do too was talk about um, even if you're a really large company and you're well established in a developed country and you're looking just to start a new venture in a developed country, there's still a lot of risks. So one of the examples that can be used for this is the example of Wes Farmers. So in Australia, Wes Farmers owns Bunnings. It thought, you know, we're going to transplant Bunnings into the UK market. It's a similar developed country, similar culturally and socially. But um, Bunnings went bust in the UK, and that was because of something, a factor that those um, that West Farmers hadn't counted on, which is that there's much lower um, interest in doing DIY amongst the UK community. So even when you have a huge ASX listed company um, with an established brand, it can sometimes fail. So there is a lot of risk involved. Um, the other thing I heard from companies is that there's this problem where, with the trilateral partnership whereby the Australian, um, US and Japanese governments um, are expecting business to approach them to capitalise on the support available. Whereas in the business community, if you've got a proposal or a pitch, you're meant to come to business and pitch that proposal. So business felt like they weren't being courted enough um, by the government and it shouldn't be on them to come and solve government's problem. So in my paper, I propose four different recommendations. I'm just going to talk about the key recommendation now because I really do want everyone to go and read my report. So the problem that I want to solve is this issue of trying to, you know, make a funnel for business, an easy access point for them to start to look at infrastructure in our region. So 
I, I'm suggesting that Australia, the US and Japan establish a mechanism that can act as a front door first stop shop for industry. At the moment, there are multiple avenues for industry to try and get into this field. They can approach a multinational development bank like the ADB or AIIB. They can approach recipient governments directly and partner with them. They can either par even partner with other industry partners. So none of those options are the trilateral infrastructure partnership. So this is my recommendation. And again, I'm going to share my screen. So it's an Indo-Pacific infrastructure program, a first stop shop for companies to get involved in this. Um, it would be nestled within an existing multilateral program so that you're not creating additional frameworks um, and cluttering the already cluttered environment. It would be focused specifically on the Indo-Pacific, which other infrastructure hubs are not, um, be a single point of entry, and importantly, offer this brokerage service and other supporting functions. It would provide an independent, commercially viable infrastructure pipeline and coordinate a regular infrastructure symposium. So this, would, would, this symposium would act as like a matchmaking service for government and industry. Um, in addition to that, it could also offer training. You know, Australia has fantastic skills and expertise in the mining sector, and we could share that with um, Southeast Asian or Pacific Island uh, companies and contractors. The other important thing I want to note about this Indo-Pacific infrastructure program is that it would be run and administered separately from government. And I'm trying here to resolve some of the challenges that DFAT, DFC and JBIC have in terms of agreeing on infrastructure priorities. Um, the other thing too that I would note is that I'd like it to be run by finance experts, multilateral development bank staff and project managers and developers that have on the ground expertise in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, which is often lacking um, in the trilateral countries themselves. So that is just one way that we can reinvigorate the trilateral partnership. Um, the reason I think we should do this now is because the longer we wait to make these improvements, the less options there are gonna be for our neighbors in Southeast Asia and the Pacific on who they partner with on infrastructure. And the longer we wait, Australia, the US and Japan, uh, the less opportunity there are for our corporate um, partners to really capitalize on this opportunity. So I really uh, hope you all enjoyed uh, my report and I look forward to hearing more insights from Ratika and also Kyle. Well, thank you so much, Haley. That was fantastic. Uh, I've read a lot of reports on Belt Road Initiative and infrastructure in the region, and most of them stop at, at admiring the problem, right? laying out the details. We all know the infrastructure deficit, uh, uh, but I, I appreciate that you've taken it a step further and made some very specific recommendations. I will be confessed that I really thought that you were gonna say that the reason Bunnings failed in, 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 in the UK was had something to do with a different flavor of sausages or something. I'm glad to know <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, but, but thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I would note that I think you will find whether it is in, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, with anywhere within the Indo-Pacific, there is gonna be an incredible hunger for building post COVID connectivity. And so the timeliness of your report really couldn't be better as people figure out ways to do it. Now, let's go to, to a, a, a more detailed discussion. Kyle, again, you've done a lot of work specifically on Indonesia. Um, uh, without looking at specifically at this particular trilateral network. Um, I wonder if having your depth of expertise on a particular country, uh, how this rings to you. I'd welcome your reactions to both Haley's presentation and to her report. Thanks, Gordon, and thank you, Haley, and we're really glad to have you join us as well, Ratika. Um, I'm really looking forward to our Q&A and discussion time because I think there's a lot of food for thought in Haley's piece. Um, I'll tie Indonesia into this discussion. I think Haley's research is very, very applicable to Indonesia because it links with two of President Joko, uh, Jokowi's signature initiatives. One is closing Indonesia's own domestic infrastructure gap. Uh, he's known as Indonesia's infrastructure president. In fact, today he's posted on his Instagram that he's flying to uh, Sumatra to uh, check on the progress of the Trans-Sumatran Highway. So uh, the second is he's trying to attract more foreign investment, uh, not only into infrastructure, but also industry. Um, 
But real quickly, I think it would be helpful to define Australia's interest in promoting infrastructure in Indonesia. Uh, like Haley said, Indonesia suffers from the kinds of infrastructure deficits uh, that a lot of countries in Southeast Asia um, struggle with. Uh, it is a major constraint on its economic growth. And an economically prosperous Indonesia is in Australia's interest. Um, infrastructure is part of defeating po poverty, raising living standards, managing natural disasters, and growing uh, markets. Uh, developing infrastructure and Indonesia's economy creates more opportunities to expand bilateral trade. Australian companies have a proximity advantage with Indonesia that can be supercharged by high quality infrastructure. And connected to that, there's also a trend towards building more resilient value chains uh, as a risk management strategy. Uh, more companies are transitioning from long, thin value chains to shorter, more secure ones. I think Australia and Indonesia would make a good pairing for a secure value chain. Uh, they're friendly neighbors, both are democracies, they're committed to economic cooperation, and uh, I think their value chain links really have the potential to be resilient if we can develop the infrastructure to support it. Uh, now, I want to take Haley's very helpful framework of barriers to private sector engagement and apply it to a very controversial project. Uh, this is President Jacoby's plan to move the national capital to a greenfield site in remote East Kalimantan. And I think we can view this capital move essentially as a $33 billion infrastructure project to build a city from the ground up. It basically adds billions to Indonesia's already large infrastructure gap. And the Indonesian government wants to fund at least part of its development 25% with private sector money. So there's a lot of skepticism and optimism, optimism swirling around this capital move, but, but let's apply uh, the Channer framework and see how it stacks up as a proposal to the private sector. So the first is you know, perception of risk relative to other investment options. Well, let's start out with um, the new capital is proposed for East Kalimantan. It's a relatively remote province. Without much existing infrastructure outside of the cities of Balikpapan and Samarinda uh, to support the development of a new, new capital. Uh, there also isn't, it's not clear that there's wide grassroots support for the capital, uh, even locally, uh, which is a huge risk for a company that's looking at in investing uh, for their social license. Uh, there's also the environmental impact of building a new city in the Borneo jungle. Deforestation, habitat destruction, and the impact on endangered species are top concerns. Finally, there's a question of whether or not this project will withstand the inevitable change in presidential administration, adding to the political risk profile of this project. Now, unreliable and limited data. Data is virtually non-existent at this stage. We don't have essential data points such as maps, boundaries, precise locations of the city's proposed landmarks and major infrastructure projects. We're really starting from zero here. And only last month did the Minister for Environment and Forestry actually visit the area and order ministry staff to start uh, environmental impact studies. I think the lack of data is really likely to deter private sector investors. And the third and final part, underperformance of existing project pipelines. There is not yet a single project pipeline for the new capital, for new capital city infrastructure. And it is not clear what projects the government will prioritize. It's also unclear if the government plans to upgrade uh, current infrastructure in the, nearby, in the nearby cities to support the development of the capital. So I think you can see that in its current state, the national capital is unlikely to be attractive to the risk adverse private sector. If this project needs such significant support from the private sector, I think it's unlikely to move forward on this basis. And it will probably also draw much needed attention and resources away from Indonesia's real infrastructure projects. Now, whatever comes of the national capital, 
I think there are other infrastructure needs across the Indonesian archipelago that present bankable opportunities for the private sector. So a couple final points. I think Japan has been very successful in linking new infrastructure projects with private sector activity. You can see this in West Java with the new Patimban port east of Jakarta. The Japan International Cooperation Agency provided loans for the construction of the port and the access toll road, which will connect it with nearby Karawang Industrial Park, where many Japanese industries have operations. But even where projects are bankable, Indonesia needs to reform the dominant role of its state-owned enterprises, or SOEs, in infrastructure development to attract more private sector involvement and investment. SOEs are involved in 80% of Indonesia's infrastructure projects, crowding out the private sector investment and involvement. Uh, private sector competes with the SOEs on an uneven playing field. Uh, and it's relegated uh, private sector companies to operate mostly as subcontractors under a state-owned primary contractor. Uh, this really, really needs to change. Now, finally, when I speak with business, uh, there is a lot of interest in the kinds of programs that the government is launching to support these opportunities. I saw this with the Blue Dot Network led by the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, which was announced at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum in November 2019. Now, it offered a solution to the bankability problem in places like Indonesia by announcing a project certification scheme. But its launch was a false start. It disappointed the private sector with no flagship initiative to showcase its drive and initiative or demonstrate its capability, nor did it settle on, a, on concrete certification guidelines. Now, I'll conclude on th this point. If we do intend to close infrastructure gaps, we need to make swift progress on deliverables and clarify our aims and frameworks. Haley's report makes concrete suggestions on the way forward. Uh, thank you. Fantastic, Kyle. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, and again, I think it, it's one thing to talk about these things on a conceptual framework. Uh, but when you actually bring it down to a specific country and specific projects, you begin to understand both the challenges and the potential. So that was fantastic. Uh, Ritika, we're going to go to you next. Um, um, obviously, infrastructure tends to be the, the vehicle for connectivity, whether they be ports or, or airports or railroads. And we've spent an awful lot of time at the Perth US Asia Center over the last seven years, uh, focusing on India's connectivity into this region. Um, uh, this particular report looks at the quad minus one. It hasn't focused yet on India, uh, but I very much welcome kind of an Indian perspective on, on Haley's report and, and her, her presentation. So over to you. Um, thanks, Gordon. Um, I'm delighted to be here, by the way, uh, participating in this uh, in this launch. And this is a really exciting topic, I think, and it's only going to um, increase in importance, particularly as oper operationalization now becomes the key word. Delivery of uh, from these uh, trilateral arrangements, plurilateral arrangements, cooperation agreements, and use that are being signed, because there's clearly shared interest that has been well um, and fully established. So thank you, Haley, for picking up this, uh, th this issue. Um, and this is, again, in the context of not just the sheer infrastructure demand and gap in the Indo-Pacific, but also in the context of competing visions of regional order, um, uh, which are, among other means, being pushed through infrastructure provision. So uh, I'm going to first raise three considerations to provoke further discussion on this issue um, before I touch a, a little bit on, on India. So one, um, infrastructure is traditionally a public sector enterprise. The consensus around mobilizing private capital to bridge infrastructure financing gaps is becoming increasingly important, one, in the context of a post-pandemic world, absolutely, but two, also in the context of the private sector bringing, in, bringing with it uh, a greater level of discipline, accountability, transparency, compared to opaque state-led financing. 
having said that, I think it needs to be set out at the outset that we need to be aware of the limits to the extent to which emerging regional infrastructure initiatives on their own can call on the private sector, whether it's in terms of uh, um, uh, financing or it's in terms of participation, subcontracting, et cetera. Government facilitation is going to be key, as is coordination with other efforts. No um, sub-regional or regional uh, connectivity or infrastructure project can stand on its own today. And we can see this in the plethora of arrangements that are sort of coming up. So coordination and further on networking are going to be crucial in, in, in this regard. My second point um, relates to uh, um, the sectors. You know, we talk about key infrastructure projects. We talk about um, key sectors. And I think this is an important conversation in which to involve from the outset the private sector. Which projects and which sectors are the most conducive for private sector participation? Where is the private sector most willing to participate, has or is seeking to strengthen experience, and has comparative advantage? And again, in the context of you know, uh, competitive um, regional uh, initiatives, these choices that we're seeking to put on the table, uh, clearly there are actors which have a strong experience now that they've built up over the past couple of decades in transportation and energy infrastructure provision. Um, but the good news is that there are several other sectors that today demand just as much attention. For example, the digital space. When it comes to energy, clean energy technologies, clean infrastructure, renewable energy, solar, wind. So I think these are definitely uh, areas. And when we know, um, you know, looking at private sector, uh, um, uh, uh, the attractiveness of these sectors, these particular infrastructure subsectors, such as digital and renewable energy, the, that the attractiveness is higher for private sector than in traditional transportation, energy, um, the, 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 the traditional uh, infrastructure sectors. So that's my second point. A, a third point is uh, with respect to, now the report um, focuses strongly on uh, bridging the gap effectively between uh, public and private sector interests. I think part of the puzzle is also going to be uh, recognizing and, um, uh, and including the recipient country or the host country and their perspective, not only their needs, but their constraints as well. Um, this can range from geopolitical considerations, but also legal institutional uh, gaps that they may, uh, that they may, um, that they may be facing in their own domestic context and how that is going to impact private sector cooperation. Because a lot of times, I mean, one of the, uh, the gaps is also a lack of control. That, you know, once the infrastructure has been, uh, once a project has been set up um, uh, and, and, and provided, uh, whether it was well maintained further down the line, um, whether other uh, parts of the uh, legal regulatory process uh, pipeline are going to affect the setting up of this infrastructure that the private sector has no control over. And uh, of course, then there's, in, when coming back to the geopolitical consideration, as countries hesitate to get, to not get caught between US-China competition in the infrastructure uh, space, would private sector participation, particularly at the very ideation stage, you know, so it's the private sector that is leading project um, uh, ideation, could that be a way to trust the bridge gap? Now I'm going to come to India, and I was nodding throughout Kyle's uh, Kyle's remarks because a couple of times there were there, there were places where I was like, "Yep, that's a situation in India too." Um, and again, of course, because these are both uh, emerging market economies, um, India is in a unique position since one, it is both a market for uh, infrastructure investments, and because it is also involved in regional infrastructure development on its own. Um, so a couple of observations on, on, on these, two, these two fronts. India's uh, domestic infrastructure demand is substantive, uh, as, as, as we're well aware. And there's been an active attempt by successive governments to increase private sector uh, participation, but with mixed results. The public sector, uh, much like in Indonesia, still accounts for the majority of infrastructure spending, not as high as 80%, but the majority of infrastructure spending in the country. And the government has only doubled down on public spending in recent years. Uh, but there is that continued focus on PPP, especially when it comes to um, management of assets, for example, port assets or power distribution. So down the line. Um, 
And the good news is that India remains one of the top destinations for private investments in infrastructure. It is an attractive market. Uh, India has 100% FDI in infrastructure. It is seeking uh, to invite, it is seeking interest from uh, companies uh, uh, across the world, um, uh, US, European Union, um, Australia. It is wooing countries to come and invest in, um, in, in India, including in infrastructure projects. Now, the Japan's, Japan's relationship with India is, again, well cataloged, well known, and it is one of the, uh, the, 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 the more successful stories in terms of how two countries can cooperate um, in the Indian context in, in infrastructure um, uh, development. Um, and secondly, when it comes to India's own engagement abroad in infrastructure development, there are again government-led initiatives under which we see Indian private subcontractors, much like Kyle mentioned in, in, um, in the context of Indonesia, whether it's in terms of engineering, construction, procurement, consultancy uh, services. Uh, but there is, an, there is an appetite for Indian uh, private sector companies to go abroad. They are currently participating in, for example, a $9, a $9 billion push for energy projects in Bangladesh. Indian companies have helped build roads in Ghana, in Nigeria, Tanzania, Gabon, private uh, powered transmission and distribution uh, in Ethiopia. Um, and since you know there's Indonesia on the table, there's also the annual India uh, Indonesia Infrastructure Forum that has so far held two editions that seeks to promote, uh, to promote Indian investment in Indonesian uh, infrastructure. And then of course, there is India and Japan emerging cooperation in third uh, countries. Bangladesh is a, a prime example again here. Um, uh, we've got uh, Japanese and Indian private companies that are working together in uh, Dhaka's uh, metro project, for example, and finance comes from uh, coming from uh, Japan. Um, uh, and there was uh, news just a couple of days ago that Reliance Geo, which is one of the bigger uh, conglomerates in, in India, is building a, a submarine cable network that connects India to its east with Singapore and to its west with Middle East and Europe. So there's clearly appetite and clearly blue chip companies um, are, are looking for opportunities to uh, build both India's infrastructure profile, but also connect it with its uh, immediate neighborhood. So I think I'm gonna stop there and hopefully we'll uh, get into a broader conversation in the, uh, in, in the discussion round. Well, I have, during the course of these three presentations, have written down a list of 20 questions that I've got of myself just because they were so fascinating. I appreciate it. Um, let me mention to all of those of you who are watching this live, uh, if you'd like to use the chat function, if you've got kind of a burning specific question, feel free to click on the chat function and I'll get to as many of them as I possibly can. But let, let me kind of start off uh, with a big picture kind of question. Um, uh, you know, Haley, you were pretty candid about uh, you know the 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 lack of resourcing, the lack of political will, kind of the failing of of the initial U.S. Japan Australia cooperation. You gave some very good recommendations. Kyle, you referred to the the blue dot certification process as kind of a false start in terms of the process. And I can recall when both of these were announced, there was some rather scathing Chinese commentary that says, "Aren't you missing a few zeros?" Right in, in terms of just the the sheer the amount of numbers that engaged in the process. So the question I have for you is this, that was the situation two years ago, pre-COVID, um, but today, you know, there's a world of other issues we're dealing with. India is in the throes of its own particular fight with COVID. Uh, uh, the United States is coming out of it to some certain degree. Australia has kind of locked ourselves down in a fortress Australia kind of mentality. Um, and if you look at international issues that we're focusing on, combating pandemics is gonna be priority number one for at least a year to come. Uh, there is a, a justifiable and broad-based focus on climate change. And so, you know, the, the U.S. president-elect Joe Biden didn't hold a big international conference on infrastructure. He held one on, 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 on climate change. So I'm kind of curious from your view, um, where you get the political will to address this? Is it going to be essentially just the, the needs on the ground that's going to drive trilateral cooperation on this? And so, Haley, I'm going to start with you on this. Because um, again, you've come up with a very good recommendation, but given everything else and given where we are in the world today, the short answer is, is infrastructure a priority issue? Um, can I get you to answer that? Kind of? 
Yeah, thank you, Gordon. And it is a really important question because, like you say, there are, aren't there more important issues the government should be focused on right now? To answer your question, I would say we're at a critical juncture now in terms of the infrastructure needs of our Pacific neighbours and Southeast Asian countries. Whichever country or countries go in to partner with these um, developing economies is going to have a lot of influence in the region going forward. And also, in terms of generating just the political will here at home, that is another question because when you think about infrastructure, there is an aid and development aspect to it. And a lot of resources have been taken away from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And sometimes it can be a harder case to make that we should be prioritizing infrastructure. The way I think we can win that argument is to say, there's a missed opportunity here for Australian businesses to get in on the ground level with these um, emerging markets and make a profit. Um, so very much like with a liberal conservative government, it's important to emphasize the jobs, 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 and the fact that we would be generating, um, you know, commercial gain for Australian businesses to get a, uh, get on the ground in our region and start building this critical infrastructure because not only is it good for Australian business, there are those um, partnership benefits. You know, we really, really would start to be developing a deeper, more trust um, a building approach to partners in our region. We already do do this in the Pacific with the um, like Australian infrastructure for financing for the Pacific. Um, but we need to do it a lot more in Southeast Asia and commit more of the resources that we have at our disposal. Fantastic. Uh, Ritika, you, you rightly focus on something that I think a lot of people in the region yet haven't focused on, which is the regional and global reach of, of, of Indian corporations like Reliance, et cetera, that, that are reaching beyond the subcontinent. So can I ask you that same question from an Indian perspective? Is there a recognition there of both the infrastructure needs uh, and the prioritization of those infrastructure needs in this region? Absolutely. I mean, from an Indian perspective, the infrastructure gap is a day-to-day -day lived reality for us here in the country, um, as well as a recognition that South Asia as a, uh, as, as, as a grouping, as, as a region, um, has a, a way to go before it can be a, um, an, an integrated uh, uh, unit. And there are benefits for India's own economic uh, development. For example, the Northeast, um, its eastern uh, coast. So, um, so I think the, and that is exactly one of the reasons why India has been able to increase its development partnership with countries um, in, in, its, uh, in, its, in its neighborhood, first and foremost uh, there. So I think it, because it's a lived reality for many of us, um, and the pandemic has only sort of hit home the message that there is a critical need for economic infrastructure, absolutely. So we talk about transport corridors, um, connecting regions, et cetera, uh, for trade and investment uh, benefits, but also social infrastructure, whether that's health, um, whether that's education, whether that is uh, water and sanitation systems. So there is absolutely an interest. And, and this is also in the context of uh, digital and green transitions. That is the current focus of this particular century. We understand that climate change is a big uh, obstacle. And here's an opportunity to see whether India can participate in, can lead, can export, can create, can innovate itself as long as well as with partners, 21st century solutions, right? And there's, a, there, there's, a, there's, there's plenty of uh, opportunity here and need of the hour as well to focus on such technologies, um, such, uh, uh, such solutions that can be implemented. And this also, if we talk specifically hard infrastructure, right? Sustainability is a key issue there. Um, infrastructure is also um, uh, uh, contribute to um, emissions. So in terms of how to, when we talk about sustainable infrastructure, it's not just from a financing standpoint, it's also, there's also the construction angle to it. So when Haley, for example, mentioned uh, the experience of um, Australian companies that can be shared, here is yet another space. And this is for, any cooperation now is going to have longer term, midterm consequences later down, down the line. And we're witnessing this with the fact that with, with the climate change, the race to control or to mitigate to adapt to climate change. We don't want to lose further time and further um, uh, 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 benefit that we can, you know, um, to adapt 
uh, to, to the challenge. Fantastic. So Kyle, uh, both Haley's paper and her conversation thus far has really centered on Southeast Asia. In addition to Indonesia, obviously you've looked at Vietnam and others as well. I don't presume there's any doubt within Southeast Asia as a region about the, the prioritization of infrastructure. Yeah, that's right, Gordon. I think infrastructure will continue to be a priority for those countries. Uh, we're far off from closing these gaps. And because of COVID-19, uh, budgets are getting tight. Um, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, others are going to need to rely on uh, international assistance and um, private sector investment more than before the pandemic. And, you know, we, we quote a lot of numbers, you know, 1.7 trillion for the whole region per year. In Indonesia, it's, you know, there's a World Bank figure, 500 billion over five years. These are, these are just huge numbers, right? And COVID-19 and the economic fallout of that pandemic uh, isn't shrinking those at all. In fact, it's, it's large, uh, making them larger. So um, I think I'd also say, um, look, hospitals are infrastructure. Um, vaccine rollout requires infrastructure, in some cases, quite advanced infrastructure, right? Um, but yeah, I think it'll continue to be a priority. Well, I appreciate your last point there, Kyle. Um, uh, as you may know, in the United States right now, there's this massive debate about an infrastructure bill proposed by by the US President Joe Biden, $2.3 trillion, right? Which is, to put that in context to our Aussie viewers, you know, our entire annual gross domestic product is about $1.3 trillion. So $2.3 trillion is a lot of money. Uh, and a lot of the debate has centered on what do we mean by infrastructure? Uh, and a lot of that is in Ritika is spot on, is focusing on next generation infrastructure. It's not just roads and bridges and dams and, and, and railroads in that regard. Hey, look, thank you. I mean, I, I thought that first round was really, really helpful. Uh, for me, it, it identified two drivers behind uh, the paper, which are basically Haley's solution in search of an, an initiative. And the drivers are, as Ritika pointed out, that in the, the, the pandemic has hit hard uh, and it's made us recognize the importance of these things because the consequences of not having her there. The second factor has been the unspoken factor that we've been talking about, and that's competition. You know, if you go back to the U.S. Cold War, the space race, it, competition helps. It, it helps motivate uh, governments. It helps uh, motivate the allocation of resources. And if you're looking at the South Pacific already, in the one case that Haley did point out where there is cooperation, that was driven by competition. Um, and I think probably everywhere in Southeast Asia, there's going to be concern about, again, quality, standards, openness, transparency, and influence, uh, and competition drives it there. Hey, look, uh, we got a great question in from Tom Wilkins, who's at the University of Sydney and apparently also works for the Japan Institute of International Affairs and asks, could any of the presenters comment on how trilateral slash quadrilateral economic cooperation ties in with shared security or geostrategic objectives among the trilateral TSD slash quad powers? Uh, and it says, he says, it, it, it seems the two spheres are becoming increasingly inseparable. And this was actually my big question too. And I actually might start with Ritika on this one, right? Because my, my initial thing is when the Blue Dot Certification Network came out, the quad was still relatively nascent. It was a trilateral security dialogue. It was relatively low level. But in the last six months alone, you've had a quad foreign ministers meeting at a foreign minister level for the first time in Tokyo. And then this past March 13th, you had a quad leaders um, you know, virtual dialogue that ended up on a specific agenda focusing on vaccines, on technology, on climate change that resulted in you know, a, a specific white paper as well, not a white paper, but a, a list of an agenda and then a joint op-ed. So um, is this conversation missing something? Should this really be, uh, rather than a trilateral conversation, should this be a quadrilateral conversation? I'll start with you, Ritika. Sorry, just to reiterate, um, what should be a uh, quadrilateral conversation? So about, about infrastructure. So as, there, as it is right now, the paper that Haley wrote, you know, it, it is focused on something that was initiated several years ago, which is this trilateral, you know, coordination between Japan, the US and Australia and infrastructure. Um, uh, and the question is, is there any reason say for Indonesia's inclusion or uh, India's inclusion or say exclusion in that process? Is this a natural fit for the quad? 
Um, so uh, I'd like to say here that I think uh, the quad and the quad plus platforms are uh, only going to, um, uh, there's a right step that's been taken in terms of providing a functional footing to the quad. And um, the, uh, the joint statement did not necessarily mention uh, strategic cooperation, naval cooperation, maritime security cooperation, um, but um, I think it's been well uh, said in, in, you know, it's been well recognized that not everything needs to be said. Um, but with respect to these interest-based uh, 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 programs or these interest-based, uh, issue-based, sorry, these issue-based uh, cooperation that we're now seeing also materialize through the Quad platform, the three that you mentioned, climate change, um, uh, critical technology, and vaccine development, right? That throws the door open for other such issue-based cooperation um, on this platform. Infrastructure is obviously uh, one, of those, uh, one of those sectors where, again, there is a shared uh, interest and some sense of a common vision of a free and uh, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific in that, in, in that regard. But we also can't forget, and I think that's, that's an open, it, the door is open for that conversation to happen on the Quad platform. But I think here it's also important to note that there are already trilateral uh, mechanisms that exist between these four players. Right, so we have the India, Japan, um, uh, US uh, uh, trilateral. We have the uh, India, Australia, um, and uh, Japan uh, trilateral. We have a, a conversation happening between India, Australia, and Indonesia. So I think there is plenty of scope for um, these smaller trilaterals to coordinate with the quadrilateral, right? And I think because so many of the players are the same, but in different permutations and combinations, I, I would like to stress again, the coordination aspect, right? Uh, on unilateral initiatives, bilateral progress, uh, where these countries can engage or cooperate, um, uh, pool together information on uh, existing initiatives, that is going to be critical, um, as well as, of course, how each of these uh, of these groupings can provide additionality to each other's working. And we're seeing the same topics emerge in each of their agendas. It's maritime security. It's uh, uh, maritime uh, governance. Um, it's infrastructure development. So there's a lot of commonality that we're seeing. But I think in terms of operationalization, it's perhaps easier to do so in a, a trilateral format and not necessarily have everything happen at the quad level, right? The quad level engagement, I personally fully foresee that it's only going to increase, right? So there's obviously that route to, to go to, to, to work towards. But if you notice, even when it comes to uh, the, three, um, uh, the three areas that were identified, um, the vaccine development was of course the most fleshed out. Even there, it was more in terms of individual um, uh, steps that these countries were taking, except for of course, uh, uh, increasing vaccine production in India. That was truly the one collaborative effort that the Quad has put forward. Beyond that, it's the coordination and the, the uh, uh, yeah, on that aspect. Yeah, that's strong. Thank you. I mean, you, your focus on coordination is, is spot on. And also your, your narrative about you know, the overlapping uh, 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 agendas of all the various things we're doing. And I think you're going to see a lot of that. Probably Haiti saw a lot of that in the process of writing this report. So Haiti, I'll turn to you. Any reactions to that or to Ritika's uh, response? Yeah, thanks very much, Gordon. And thanks, Tom, for his question, which um, is really about to like, are there lots of synergies, both economically and strategically with the four countries? And I would say, yes, although it's probably lagging with India the most in terms of the India-Australia relationship. Um, the Quad already announced uh, in, at the leaders meeting, one of the outcomes was that they were going to cooperate on quality infrastructure. So they have already flagged that this is an area that they are considering. And there's trilateral US, Japan, India um, infrastructure initiatives already underway. What I did wanna say though was, um, say we had had a second Trump presidency, which um, you know is not totally out of the realms of possibility, 
um, I don't think there would have been a quad leaders meeting and therefore you wouldn't have had any of the current momentum that you have on the quad. Does that mean that, you know, the quad would be looking at infrastructure? I don't think so. Um, so in another world where um, there was no quad leaders meeting, would we even have been working on this together? Um, I think there is an open question about that because already, you know, for decades, Japan has been doing heaps of work on infrastructure in the region. It's been working very quietly in the background. In contrast, China has been working very loudly and promoting its successes. Um, similarly, the United States has been investing, um, you know, working with recipient countries directly. So there's a, a broader question here, and I think Ratika hit on it perfectly, which is, um, sure, we all have our individual ways we are doing this. What is the benefit in working together? And there are a few benefits in working together that for me are implicit, but maybe they should be made explicit. And, and that, uh, that is that um, working together, you all agree that, you know, we're looking for quality infrastructure and we can work independently, but that's not as strong as if you're in concert with a combined message. And I think that's something that the Trilateral Infra Infrastructure Partnership and the Quad share is that they both, they, you know, both agreements um, see the benefit in working together and the statement that that makes as a collective to the region rather than just doing it independently. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually going to go right back to that exact same question in that, um, it, you know, US has tremendous levels of investment all throughout the region, Southeast Asia in particular, mostly private sector, but very little of it actually in infrastructure. Australia has got tremendous interest, relatively little in the way of capital other than our super stuff, you know, and little in infrastructure. And yet it's Japan. It was the, the, the Japan Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. So the, the cheeky question is, why does Japan need us, right, uh, in terms of that process? And I think you've answered that very well. Hey, uh, Kyle, any, any final observations on, on, on kind of the overlap between the quad and that or, or uh, what we, we've, we've covered thus far? Well, I think uh, Haley and Ratika have done well covering the quad. But look, I think one thing I'll add is um, in, in Indonesia with their uh, approach to infrastructure, and I argued this in um, the report that I wrote two years ago, I think uh, the cooperative aspect suits uh, Indonesia quite well. I think um, they'd like to see uh, you know, several countries, all kinds of different configurations uh, cooperating uh, on infrastructure uh, in their country, I think that would be uh, quite welcome. So I think I think that suits um, uh, Indonesia's uh, position uh, quite well. Uh, that's the one thing I'll add. Well, Haley began this conversation with a wonderful comparison to the movies, you know, <laughs> and I think we did get a fair amount of uh, of uh, intrigue, action, and drama. Uh, but also another key uh, element of the entertainment sector is to leave people wanting more. And I've, I've got a lot of questions, but I didn't get to the questions that were, were shared beforehand or during the course of it, but that indicates that it was a vibrant and quick hour long discussion. Haley, congratulations on the launch of your report. It's fantastic. I think it's going to be something that's, that is well received in the region uh, and debated. Uh, Ritika and Kyle, thank you for joining us today for what uh, which was a very rich conversation. To all those who took the time to join us either this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, your time, uh, we really appreciate your interest. We hope that you will follow uh, the continuing events and research reports of the Perth US Asia Center, uh, because obviously uh, good infrastructure is built to last, uh, and, and the Perth US Asia Center is doing our best to build the intellectual infrastructure of the Indo-Pacific, and that includes wonderful Indo-Pacific fellows like uh, uh, Ritika uh, and our efforts to understand this region more broadly. Thank you so much. We look forward to the next meeting. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gordon. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks.